Well, good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It is a blessed day today and be in the house of the Lord and all of it belongs to God. So even though we're not in the church proper, this is the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Well, today again is our fourth annual revival by the Riverside Church Service. The first word, if you notice of this event, besides fourth, is the gathering of the saints is revival. That's the first word. It's revival by the Riverside. I looked up, I wanted to find out what does it mean? What does revival really mean? Because we use that word a lot. And these are the definitions. There's actually secular and religious definitions of revival. The first is this, an improvement in the condition or strength of something. An improvement in the condition or strength of something. The second definition is an instance of something becoming popular, active, or important again. The third is this, it's a new production of an old play or a similar work. The fourth definition, a reawakening of religious fervor. And the fifth and final is a restoration to bodily or mental vigor, to life or consciousness. Now the title of today's sermon, if you've seen in your bulletin, is Perilous Times Stand Firm. That's the name of the sermon today. And it doesn't really take a Sherlock Holmes or any kind of detective to see that as Christians, as Americans, we're in perilous times. We're currently in perilous times, and we're also looking ahead to the coming perilous times. And church, we're going to need to stand firm. Amen? Amen? I mean, we are going to need to be strong, and we need revival. We desperately need revival. We need revival in the church. Amen? I mean, the church needs a revival right now. And not only does the church need a revival, we need revival across our land as a country, but also we need revival personally. Every day we need a constant and personal revival. Things have to change. Would you agree? Things need to change. Things cannot continue along the same trajectory that they are on now. As a nation, we are actually, as a Christian nation, we are rapidly headed toward the edge of the proverbial cliff. And somebody, somebody has to be willing to just stop and reverse direction. Somebody's got to be willing to do that. Somebody has to be willing to be that one person like Isaiah who when the Lord, he had his vision of heaven and he was transported to the throne room of God and God looked around and he said, I, I, there's nobody. You remember what Isaiah said? Here I am, Lord. Send me. And you see a revival, that reawakening that we want so bad. I mean, I want to see my country the way it used to be. I want to see my country uh, a holy country. I want to see it to be revived the way the founders brought it in. I, I want to see the church to be revived, false teachers kicked out, and people worshiping the true God. I want to see revival. I want to see that reawakening. But you know where that has to start? It has to start with me. It has to start in here and in here. And so we do this revival. We do so by, by living like Christ. But more accurately, we do so by letting Christ live His life through us. And this is eternal, internal. It's an internal thing. The internal revival, this is accomplished through what's called the spiritual disciplines. Now these disciplines, if you've heard of spiritual disciplines before, maybe you haven't, the spiritual disciplines, they're meant to train you and me. That's what they're designed to do. Train you and me in how to live the Christ-like life. It's one thing to say, I want to live like Christ. It's another thing to know how to do it, right? I mean, how do you do that? So the disciplines are meant to train you and me how to live the Christ-like life. And we're all familiar with Proverbs 22.6. Maybe you're not familiar with the actual verse, but you're familiar with what it says. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. That's Proverbs 22.6, but how many of you know that it's not just children who need to be trained? It's not just children that need to be trained. Of course, we know that as Christians, new believers... Maybe you haven't been a believer for a while. But maybe you're still a child in your walk with God. And so God's Word refers to us as children. And as God's children, we need to also be taught in the ways of God. How to walk pleasing to Him. 
pleasing to our fellow man. And that's where the spiritual disciplines come in. Spiritual disciplines are meant to teach us, to train us how to grow closer to God, how to be more like Christ. But then you might ask, well, why is that even important? I mean, I'm saved, right? So isn't that where it ends? I mean, I'm saved. I'm good to go. So why is it important that, that I'm trained up, that I have to go through this training? I didn't know there was going to be work involved. It's because there are, these are perilous times. And perilous, more perilous times are coming. And we need to stand firm. We need to be immovable. Matter of fact, uh, if you have your Bibles, if you would, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. Christ actually speaks of the times that I'm talking about, these perilous times. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew uh, chapter 24, starting at verse number 3. I'll be reading the first 13 verses, starting at verse 3. It says this in Matthew 24, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, speaking of Jesus, the disciples came to him privately, in other words, they came away from the crowds, and they said, Tell us, when will these things be? Because Jesus had just predicted the destruction of the temple. They said, tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming? When are you coming? And he says, and of the end of the age. So they want to know. I'm sure just like you and I, we would like to know. Wouldn't we? We would like to know, Jesus, when are you returning? And so Jesus answered, and he said to them, he said this, take heed that no one deceives you. In other words, there are going to be people that are going to try to deceive you. He says, many will come in my name. They'll be coming professing to be Christians. They're saying that, that I am the Christ and, the, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars. You will hear of rumors of wars. He says, but see that you're not troubled because all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. He said, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. He says, there will be famines. There will be pestilences. In other words, there'll be viruses and sicknesses. There'll be earthquakes in various places. He says, but all these, they're the beginning of the sorrows. You see, perilous times are coming. He says, and then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Just for saying that you're a Christian, you're going to be hated. And then many will be offended. And they will betray one another and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and they'll deceive many. Again, claiming to be speaking for Christ, for the church. He says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So here he said that there would be many false prophets claiming to speak in his name. And why do they do that? Because they're trying to lead Christians away from the truth. They're trying to lead them to a false gospel, to a false Christ, one that has no power to save. And unfortunately we see that today with the woke movement. The woke movement. It's invaded the church. It's even invaded pulpits. It has perverted the gospel. It's perverted God's word. And he says, he continues to say there's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. Do we see war? Do we hear of rumors of war? He says, nation will rise against nation. Kingdoms against kingdoms. Church, today, we face threats from China, Russia, Iran, the Middle East, many Muslim nations, and they all seek to destroy our country. And if they could, they can't, but if they could, they would all seek to destroy and snuff out Christianity. Now, they can't do it. They can bring great persecution, but the last time I remember reading, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church Amen. and so the kingdom of darkness right now church it's rising and it's seeking to battle the kingdom of light 
False religions abound. Atheistic, the humanistic atheism, Islam, you name it. They all want to see the light of Christ extinguished once and for all. And as evil, as evil as they are, they're not the real threat. The real threat to the church is from within. The enemy has invaded our ranks. The false prophets who lead many astray. You see, they warp and they pervert the gospel. They warp and they pervert the scriptures. Teaching not the gospel of thee, but they teach a gospel of me. In other words, they teach us to think, well, what feels good to me? What do I think is right? What should I do? Instead of, God, what do you want me to do? And Jesus warns that all these forces, they're all going to join together. They're all going to join together to deliver you and me up to tribulation, true believers. It says, in it, and he says that you will be put to death. You will be hated by all nations because you name the name of Christ. Have you seen this in the news lately? Everybody's familiar with the Pope. He has actually joined hands with the Islam world and they are creating a one world religion worship center and a one world religion calling it Chrislam. It's real. Google it. Check it out. It opens, their headquarters opens next year in 2020. So they're joining hands. And you're going to be hated because you say, no, that's wrong. The Bible says. They don't know what the Bible says. And when this persecution begins, and I'm not talking about people just making fun of you because you're a Christian. I'm talking about when real persecution begins. Jesus reveals in verse number 10, if you're looking at Matthew 24, that many, he says, now hear me, many are going to fall away. Many are going to betray one another and actually hate one another. In church, we're already seeing this happening today. We're seeing this happen today here in America. We're seeing it with professing Christians turning on other Christians over something that, like the masks and the vaccine mandate. Christians turning against Christians. Now let me be clear about this. I am not anti-mask. I am not anti-vaccination. I'm also not pro-mask and I'm not pro-vaccination. I, I believe it's a personal choice for every human being to make. It's your choice. But not everybody sees it that way. You see, I, I consider myself to be a personal freedom guy. In other words, you're free to follow your conscience. You're free to do that, but so am I. But many today, they want to force you to violate your God-given conscience. God has given you a conscience to know right from wrong. And if they say that if you won't comply to their demands, then it must be that you hate people. That you want people to die, is what they say. I mean, does that even sound right? Is that even No, it's not what I want at all. I want you to turn to Christ. That's what I want. But see, people are turning against people. And many are doing it in the name of Christ. Well, if you're a Christian, you do this. I don't find that anywhere. And because people are so wrapped up, they have their minds wrapped up in CNN and in Fox News and social media, church, they become blinded to the truth. And I'm not just talking about unbelievers, I'm talking about believers. They see you and me as the enemy. And to further flame this divide, Jesus says again in verse 11 that many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Preaching a false gospel. Too many pastors, too many preachers and teachers have jumped onto this bandwagon. They, they join hands with the world. Many people are teaching this, this critical race theory, transgenderism, homosexuality, abortion on demand. They're teaching this all from the pulpit. And it's okay. Church, these are professing Christians. These are professing Christian pastors that are they're advocating and siding with the world. And it's a worldly satanic position that they're siding with. And God hates that. 
And His wrath is kindled against these demonic issues today and against those who support and teach them. And because, Jesus says, because lawlessness will be increased. Notice He doesn't say that it might, it, lawlessness might increase. He says it, it will be. He says because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many are going to go cold. People are going to stop loving one another. They're going to stop showing mercy. They're going to stop showing grace. No longer will professing Christians show love and grace and mercy and kindness and compassion. But he says their love is going to turn to hate. It's going to turn to anger and vengeance. But, verse 13, Jesus says, the one who endures to the end of all this, will be saved. Now, when you read that, the one who endures to the end will be saved, that doesn't mean that if you fall away, if you don't endure, it doesn't mean that, well, you lost your salvation, you tried it hard, you tried the best you could, but you failed, you gave up, and so you've lost your salvation now. Well, salvation is of the Lord. If you fall away, if you don't endure, it means, it reveals that you were never truly saved. That's what it means. John said that much in 1 John 2.19. He said this. John wrote, They went out from us. In other words, they left the faith, they left the brethren, they left the church because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, he says, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out. They left. They fell away that they might be made manifest. And that word manifest means that it's plain for all to see that they were not all of us. Church, we're seeing today, it's almost, it almost seems like every week now you see some professing Christian musician now that says, oh, I'm really an atheist. I don't really believe in God. Because they never really did. They may have had an experience at one point in their life. They may have been raised in the church. But it doesn't mean they were born again. It doesn't mean they were saved. So I say that to say this, church, we're in perilous times right now. We are. I, and I don't know about you, but in my short 47 years, I'm 47, right? Is that right? Sorry, 47. But, somebody said yes. Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. I don't know. You get out this, you just forget. Days or whatever. But I haven't seen the world like it is now. Can anybody else testify? You've not seen in your time here on earth, you've not seen times like they are? So we're in perilous times. The enemy is not only without our walls, outside the walls, but they're within. They're in our country, they're in our culture, and they're even within the church. And it's like a cancer today. In church, we need a revival. We need... A strengthening in the church. We need a restoration. We need a renewing. We need a reawakening of God's people. We need to stand firm. We need to be immovable in our convictions and in our faith. There's a word, an old word. It's called resolute. Have you heard that word? Resolute. We have to be resolute. I mean, that word means we have to be purposeful in what we do and what we say. We need to be determined and we need to be unwavering. But it doesn't matter what the way the world goes. It doesn't matter what people say and what people do. Not even what they do to me. I'm going to be unwavering. I'm not going to move. I know what God's Word says and I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to stay with it and I'm not going to be moved. Unwavering. I mean, resolute. It's been said that every generation has to bear the burden of their own wars and their own battle. The greatest generation, they had World War II. Then we had a generation that had to deal with the Korean War. Then we had the, the Vietnam era. Then we had the Middle East conflicts. And you just keep going backward through history. Every generation has a war to fight. In church right now, we do too. We have a truth war. Yes. But it's not to be fought with guns and bombs. It's to be fought with the Word of God and with truth. And praise God, the Word of God and God is on our side. Yes. So we've got to be resolute. In church, we see it all through Scripture. You think about the children of Israel. They're in Egypt. You had Moses and Pharaoh, right? And then you fast forward and you come to Esther and Haman, the one that wanted to destroy the Jewish people. 
and her uncle Mordecai. Remember, she was kind of wavering. He said, Lester, you've got to go to the king. You've got to, you've got to plead for him on our behalf. You've got to speak to him. She says, I can if I go to him. If he doesn't hold out that scepter to me, I could be killed. You remember what he said to her? How do you not know that you were born for such a time as this? Same question can be posed to me and you today. How do you not know that you, that you were not born for such a time as this? It's not an accident that you're here today. It's not an accident that you were born when you were born. It's not an accident at all. God is in control. You're exactly where He wants you to be. And these are perilous times. We have to stand strong. We have to stand firm. In church, if you endure to the end, and by the end, I mean if you endure until the return of Christ or until your end, you're going to receive your reward. So now maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor, I want to stand firm. I want to do it. I want to be strong. I want to endure to the end. Does that describe anybody today? Does anybody want to endure to the end today? You might want to stand firm and stand strong. Yes. Well, I want to. So that begs the question, how? Do I just keep doing what I've been doing? Or is there more? How do you endure? How do you stay strong? How do you stay start, uh, strong, firm, and faithful? And the answer is, again, spiritual disciplines. Starting next week, Lord willing, unless He changes things, I'm going to start a new sermon series teaching through the spiritual disciplines. Richard Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, he actually he categorizes uh, all the spiritual disciplines down into three separate sections. The first is inward disciplines. So that will be the first thing that we look at, our inward disciplines. And then it goes to the outward disciplines. And then lastly, to the corporate disciplines. That means us together. And then in each one of these, we're going to get to see what God's Word tells us about prayer. Maybe you're like, I want to pray. I want to be a person of prayer. But how do I pray? What is prayer specifically? I want to be a person of prayer. Because you, do you know that our battle is not a physical battle? Our battle is a spiritual battle. Scripture tells us that. So we need to do battle in the spiritual realm. And then all we learn about prayer, we're going to learn about biblical meditation. I'm not talking about like sitting on a rock somewhere on top of a mountain like, oh. That's not what I'm talking about. It's about biblical meditation. Fasting. We haven't talked much about fasting, but that is an important thing. There are parts in the Scriptures where you hear Jesus say, the old, if you remember this child that was possessed by a demon, the disciples, they tried over and over and over to cast out this demon. They couldn't do it. Jesus comes along, cast out the demon, and the disciples are like, how would you do that? We tried. We've cast out demons before. We couldn't cast out this demon. What would you do different? You remember what He said. Some things can only be done through prayer and fasting. So we'll be talking about fasting. And then study. I want to read my Bible. I want to study. How do I do that? We're going to look at that. Simplicity. Solitude. Just getting alone. You and God. Submission. Service. Confession. Worship. Guidance. Celebration. These are all the spiritual disciplines. And there are 12 of them, as a matter of fact. 12 specific areas to help you grow in your faith and your walk with Christ. So if you've ever wanted a, a deeper and a more intimate relationship to your God and to your Savior, then you're not going to want to miss this new series. And again, Lord willing, we're going to, we're going to take this walk together starting next week. We'll go through it hand in hand. Because guess what? When I preach to you, I'm preaching to myself too. In church, this is Discipleship 101. If you've never discipled anyone, this is going to give you the tools to do that. So do you want to see God revive our land? You do? Do you want to see, you want to see God restore our country and our church to an authentic Christianity and holiness? Would you like to see that as well? It has to start with you and me. It has to start right here. You know, it's easy to look at other people and pray and say, God, change that person. God, I want you to fix them. You might ever prayed that, God, change them, fix them. I know I've prayed that. But you know, it's a lot harder 
It's a lot harder to pray, God, change me. Change my mind. Change my heart. Maybe the issue's not with them. Maybe it's with me. So God, change me. Do it quickly. You see, church, playtime is over in America. Playtime's over. And they're talking about now, seeing the news, there's many restaurants and businesses in certain states that you're not going to be able to buy and shop if you're not vaccinated. Yeah. They'll let you go hungry. They'll say, we're not keeping it from you, you're keeping it from you. Playtime's over. The church has largely has been asleep. How do I know? Look at America today. What's happening right now is a direct result of the church not being the church. We've handed the reins over to the world for morality. And we're seeing the rotten fruit of this abdication. We've given away our duty. We as the church, I'm not talking about Franklinville Wesleyan Church, I'm about we universally the church. We have by and large failed to fulfill our responsibility and our duty to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel and make disciples. Because that's what's going to change hearts. That's what's going to change our country and that's what's going to change the world. The preaching of the gospel and making disciples. So again, the church has fallen asleep. Proverbs 24, Solomon, he says this, a little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. He says, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed man. Church, the church has slept while corruption and perversion has grown wildly and, and overtaken society and the culture today, poverty, a famine of godliness and holiness, has pounced on America. And a scarcity of true Christianity, true conversions, has attacked our country and our churches. And so God, in His sovereignty, what has He done? He's allowed evil to rise and reign, to awaken us. So here's my question. Has it worked? In other words, are you awake yet? Are you alarmed at what you see when you look at the news and you see stuff happening around you and in the culture? Are you alarmed by that? Are, are, do, do the warning bells go off when you watch a children's program meant for little, little kids? And all it teaches is about transgender and homosexuality and how it's so horrible if you've been born with a certain skin color. And, and I mean, does this not alarm you? Apostle Paul, he saw it coming. He actually wrote to warn a young preacher, Timothy, you know there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. It all happens. And so, in this warning, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, this, Paul was writing to a young preacher named Timothy. He's a young man. And by writing to him, it's in the Scriptures, by extension, Paul is warning us today of perilous times that are on the horizon and are already here. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Amen when you're there. Amen. Amen. And 2 Timothy 3, we're starting at verse number 1. Listen as I read what Paul's writing. And keep in mind, this is written about 2,000 years ago. And he was looking at times that are happening. He's talking about current events, but also future events. And see in your mind, if you have to listen to this, you're thinking, well, it sounds like I just listened to a news broadcast. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Paul writes, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers. They're without self-control. They're brutal, despisers of good. They're traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God and having a form of godliness. In other words, they're very religious. But denying its power. And from such people as this, he says, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households. They make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, 
disapproved concerning the faith. He's talking to false teachers. He says, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, Paul writes. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You need to highlight that in your Bible and remember it, so that way when persecution comes, you're not going to go, what happened? Paul told us. He says, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you, Christian, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. If you've been taught the Holy Scriptures since childhood, you are blessed. We meet many children today at our martial arts school that know nothing of God, know nothing of the Bible, and they're not being raised in that way. So if you were raised as a child knowing the Holy Scriptures, you are blessed. But Paul continues, the Holy Scriptures, they're able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then look what he says in verse 16. All Scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, all of it, the easy things, the hard things, the things we like, the things we don't. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And all of it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's talking about the spiritual disciplines. So that way... You'll be instructed in righteousness that you may be complete and that you may be thoroughly equipped. Church, you're going to have to be equipped to face the times that are coming. We may not even be able to join like this this time next year if things continue like they are. Yeah. So I charge you, Paul says, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season, be ready out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come, and I would dare say we're already here. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you... Be watchful. That's another highlight and underline. You be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. In other words, go out, preach the gospel, make disciples. Fulfill your ministry. Now that's a long section, but it sounds like Paul's describing today, doesn't it? Here's things there that sounded familiar. Paul says, turn away from people like this that we just read about. In other words, don't join hands with them. Don't join in with their ways. Don't do as they do. We're told not to be unequally yoked. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, he says this, Don't be fooled. Bad company corrupts good character. You know, many today, professing Christians say, You know what? I'm going to go out. I'm going to party with this group of people. I'm going to do like they do. And then maybe by doing that, they'll trust me. And then after some time, once I've gained their trust, then I can share the gospel with them. But you know, that's not how it normally happens. Normally what happens is that you don't drag, pull them up, they drag you down. Yes. And Scripture says, turn away from them. Turn away. In other words, don't join hands, don't join in their ways, or you might become polluted with their sins. It only takes a little bit of compromise. It only takes a little bit of that door opening for it to open wider, wider, and wider. 
You remember what the Lord said to Cain? The Lord knew the hate that was building up in Cain's heart. What did He tell him? He said, Cain, be watchful. Sin is at your door. It wants to overtake you. Church, sin is at your door. The world right now is at your door. And it wants you to compromise. But you can't. Over and over again, Scripture commands us to stand firm. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You may think, it ain't making a difference the things that I do. I'm trying so hard to invest my time and my love and my effort and my loved ones and my friends and my neighbors and my co-workers. I'm trying to preach the gospel to them and trying to be a good example. And it's, it's not doing anything. Paul says be immovable. Stand firm. Always abounding in the work of the Lord and know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Whatever you do unto the Lord, it's not in vain. Okay, well that's great, Pastor, but how do I do that? Again, how can I be firm? How can I be immovable? How can I be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord? How can I do that? And the answer again, spiritual disciplines. I'm trying to get you to burn that into your brain. Spiritual disciplines. And through the Word of God. Look again at verses 16 to 17. All Scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is our guidebook. You have to be in it every day. It's a, scripture says it's a lamp into our feet. It's a light into our path. Church, when we have our sword in hand, when you, when you have this in your hand and in your heart and in your mind, when you do that, when we are also men and women of prayer and of fasting and of study and of service, when we worship God the way He wants us to. That's in spirit and in truth. When we do these things that God wants us to do, then we're able to do what verse number 2 of chapter 4 says. We'll be able to preach the Word. And not only will we be able to preach the Word to those around us, we'll be ready in season and out of season. And what he's meaning by this is when things of God are popular and when it's not popular. Maybe even when it's illegal. And when we know God's Word, we live out God's Word, then, when we're really doing it, really living it, then, then we can convince, we can rebuke, we can exhort with all long suffering, with all teaching. And again, it's because church, we're in perilous times. I can't stress that enough. Even though the sky is blue, the sun is out, it's warm, we've got a beautiful breeze. These are perilous times. I'm not kidding you when I say that one day they will lock the doors to our church. One day we could be doing what we're doing right now and police come and they arrest us and round us up. You don't think it can happen. It's happening in Canada. It's happening all over the world. But what makes America special? So church, we have to get serious about our faith. I mean, we have to. We can't live as we've been living. If you are a born-again Christian, you have no choice. You have been enlisted in God's army. Yes. You're in the army. And His Word here proclaims, you be watchful in all things. This means pay attention to what's going on around you. Pay attention to what's happening. Pay attention to the direction the government's going and the culture's going. You've got to pay attention. You know, I know that many right now are banking on the rapture of the church before the tribulation comes, right? We'd love to see that. Amen? I mean, right, right as the enemy is at the gate, all of a sudden, zap! The Lord comes and He removes us from the earth. That, that the theology is called pre-tribulation rapture. But did you know there's many who believe in what's called a post-tribulation theology? Post and, and both, by the way, have Scripture to back up both. We have Scripture that backs up a pre-tribulation, God delivered us before it happens, but then also there's a lot of Scriptures also that point to post-tribulation. And so because many hope to be gone, many choose, well, I'm not going to pay attention, I don't really care. 
I don't need to prepare. Jesus is going to come back and He's going to rapture us away. And that'd be great. But what if the post-trib folks are the correct ones? We can't say 100%, right? We're not there. What if God allows His church to go through the tribulation? And why, why, why is our generation special? Both theologies can't be right. There can't be a pre and a post. One of them is right and one of them is wrong. And so the takeaway for you and me today is this. Live and prepare as if we're going to have to endure tribulation and afflictions. Live your life that way like you're going to have to. Be prepared. Take the things of God seriously. And if Jesus comes first and raptures His way, praise the Lord. I'd rather be prepared. That'd be like taking the spare tire out of your car, throwing it aside and saying, I'm not going to have a flat tire. You're my wife. You've had like a thousand of them so far. She is the nail whisperer. You never want to have a flat tire drive behind her. She'll gather up all the nails for you, guaranteed. I've gotten really good at changing tires almost NASCAR fast. So live prepared as if Jesus is not going to come back and get us first. And again, if He does, praise God. But if He does not, at least we're equipped and we're prepared to do the work of an evangelist, proclaiming the gospel with our words and with our lives. Did you know that God has entrusted you with a ministry? With you specifically? There are people in your life that God has entrusted to you. They may never hear the gospel except through you. God has given you a ministry to go out to make disciples. Matthew 28, make disciples, teach them to observe all the things that Jesus has commanded you. Fulfill your ministry, Paul says. And so, the message today, stand strong, be resolute in your faith, be resolute in your convictions. Do not bow to peer pressure. Do not bow to bullies. Our dad is the king. Why am I going to bow to a, a bully? Why am I going to be intimidated by some humanly bully? My Father is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of the universe. Be steadfast and be immovable. And the way that you do this is through the spiritual disciplines that God has given us. And again, starting next week, we will again, Lord willing, we're going to dig our heels in and we're going to learn what we must do to be resolute Christians even in the face of perilous times. We're not going to bow to the gods of men. We're not going to bow to their threats. We only bow to King Jesus. And I want you to keep this verse in your mind. If you have a way to write it down, it's Deuteronomy 31.6. I'll let you write it down. Deuteronomy 31.6. You may have it memorized. This is your encouragement. And this is what I close with. When we think about spiritual disciplines, when we think about the perilous times when we think about standing strong and resolute, Deuteronomy 31.6 has to be burned into your mind and your heart. And it's this. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't tremble at them. For the Lord, Yahweh, your God, is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you and He will not forsake you. Let's pray. Father God, we come to You with grateful hearts, Lord, that You are a God who cares, that You are a God who will be our defender, You will be our sword and our shield, that You will never leave us, You will never forsake us, and Lord, that You will never fail us, though we fail You every day, and though we are unfaithful every day, You remain faithful because You cannot deny Yourself. And so, Father God, we praise Your holy name today. And Father, we pray that You give us that spirit of, of resoluteness in heart and mind today that no matter what may come, whether You grant our nation a reprieve or You're going to allow great persecution to sweep across our land like the earth has never seen, that we may stay strong, we may stand firm until the end. And may we always lift Your name on high. May we always proclaim the name of Christ to all people, never backing down, never compromising. But may we do so in love and compassion for people. And now, Father, 
as we come together in a time of fellowship after this. We pray, Lord, that you will bless the meal, bless the hands that prepared it. And Lord God, we give you the praise, honor, and glory in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.